All right. So another week of personal finance. Um, this week we're going to talk about a few things, but uh, one of the more interesting bits is uh, about taxes. Um, the thing with taxes is, yeah, everybody, well, most people don't understand them. They don't have a clue. I mean, we're talking 80% of the folks. Or they, you know, people think, oh, I'm getting a big refund. I did super well. No, you, you gave a big, huge loan to the government. You you had too much money withheld. Um, or, you know, you, you're super cautious with the IRS. I'm not advocating picking a fight with the IRS. But you definitely need to look and see um, what is out there in terms of tax, you know, savings that are available for you. People call them loopholes. They're, 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 they didn't just happen. Every Everything, every element in that tax code was put in there for a purpose. And sometimes it's good, sometimes, yeah, maybe not so much. But, but the point is that, you know, the, the government more or less is trying to manipulate you into certain behavior. And if you do it, if you, you know, do that behavior, they'll tend to reward you through the tax code. And uh, and also for a lot of things, you you can do uh, certain actions in your life financially, but you do them one way that's you know tax benefit, uh, you know where it reduces uh, the amount of tax you pay, and you you can your money can go quite a bit further. So for example, let let's say you're going to save for your child's college. I realize most of you don't even have kids yet, but there's going to be a point hopefully. And uh, if you want to do that, um, you know you just open up an account and start chunking money in that and um, you know at the end of you know compound interest it's going to end up with a big chunk for for that child and if that child opts not to go to college woohoo you get all that money for yourself and you spend on something else but anyway the point my point would be if you wrote that up say in your term paper and just said yeah I'm going to start an account for my child you know, future child, and and uh, you know, will end up with this amount of money, and and you submit all that, you think you're good, and then you get your paper back, and you got whatever a C or something like that, not the grade you wanted. That's because you didn't use the tax code. There's things called 529s and and other you know vehicles out there uh, for savings. For example, a 529 account. Let's say you know you got two accounts, and uh, you know you end up with you do well. You put a hundred grand in that account all in, you know, with the with the savings that all accumulates. Well, if it's in a five twenty nine account, your child gets a hundred grand to use for education. If you just put it in a regular account, your child probably gets about seventy, eighty thousand because you put it in a taxable account. The five twenty nine account, if all those you know, if all those um, all that amount of money within that account is used for for uh, your child for educational purposes. You, there is no tax burden on you. If you use all that money for your child's education, but you didn't have it in a 529, so it's just characterized as normal money, then you know you're going to have to pay taxes on that. So, and there, you know, read the fine print, but it's not really that bad if, say, you know whatever little Johnny ends up not being that dream child you thought he was and you know it's whatever to hell with him where I'm not giving him a dime for college if you want to use that money for something else are there penalties associated maybe you know but they're they're pretty trivial and uh, it's just going to amount to the fact that you're now going to be taxed on it since you're not using it for for the child's education so fair enough but but anyway you need a plan and and the plan is that you're you know, child's not going to end it to be some, you know, dirt head, whatever. Things are going to go well for you. So the, your plan is that things are going to going to go well. So uh, background on taxes. We'll, we'll go through a little bit of this. Integral part of the economy. I'm not, you know, against taxes. They fund some necessary items. Maybe a lot of not so necessary items, but whatever. Uh, you pay taxes on everything. If you think it's just income taxes, you know, you need to, you know, uh, for me, you when I've got a bunch of vehicles, work vehicles, and every all the you know registration fees on that, those are taxes. Um, sales tax if you live in the valley, sales tax if you're traveling outside the state and you're paying other people. Um, there's all sorts of things, capital gains. You know, it's more than just income taxes, is what I'm saying. There's all sorts of user fees and and other things that are essentially taxes. And then sin taxes, you know, alcohol, cigarettes, and gasoline. So, and this, this, you know, 
is even more so. And then there's kind of almost, you know, whatever tax credits, kind of the opposite of a tax where you actually get money. And that might be for solar and now electric vehicles and all the rest of that, whatever the, you know, the current thing is, um, there'll, there'll usually be some benefits associated with that. Uh, corporations, yeah, a bit of double taxation there. Corporations pay tax, and then they pay their employees or their shareholders, and those guys get taxed again. So that's a disadvantage um, that, you know, and, and don't fool yourself. The evil corporations are not paying the tax. The evil corporations are passing that tax on to you. So when something costs a little bit more than it should, that's because they paid a little more tax than they should have. Homeowners pay property taxes, but this is... Well, it's still the tax, and it's not great, but uh, it's tax deductible. So you pay your property tax, and then when you get your federal tax, um, you pay a little less because it's counteracted by the property tax you paid. Government services and programs, and so you're going to pay at every level. Obviously, in, in Alaska, we're pretty fortunate. We don't get beat up like some of the other places. California, for example, I mean, you add in all the taxes, and yeah, I think it's around 63, 65% of your income. That's kind of silly. Because then you get to the point where people are like, well, why am I working so hard if it's just all going to taxes? So you provide a disincentive. And There's a thing called the Laffer Curve. He was a Reagan guy, so some of you may or may not like him just based upon his association. But, uh, you know, I thought he was pretty damn smart. Anyway, he had kind of a uh, a graph that shows a sweet spot. If you if you take too little tax, you know, you'll the government kind of left money on the table and if you get too aggressive you get up in the 60s in terms of taxes then you get people to spend more time trying to you know take their money to the caymans or do whatever to avoid the taxes if you leave it down in the 30s people generally just suck it up and pay it and so the government you know gets a bigger chunk it's like a pizza you know if it's a very small tax thing that the slices are very small but if you if you have say a thirty percent tax rate, but the economy's booming, that that equates to a huge pizza. So although the government's only taking thirty percent, uh, that thirty percent is a huge slice. So anyway, background on taxes: IRS, the sixty or no, what is it, eighty-seven thousand new new agents. Um, so and they're not <laughs> they're coming after you. There was actually an amendment passed to, or not passed, presented to say, hey, all these new agents should only concentrate on people making over 400000 a year. Yeah, didn't get a single vote from from um, whatever. Very partisan issue. So, um, yeah, you're going to be scrutinized. So you got to stay within the laws. There, there's two concepts here. There's tax um, evasion. Yeah, that's where you go to jail. And tax avoidance, that's... That's the way you do it. You avoid taxes. To, that's completely legal. The tax code is harsh, too, for penalties. The reason why is, let's say, you know, you're, you're involved in, like, you know, you're with the federal government and you're involved in drug enforcement. You know, trying to chase around people with drugs and guns, and that, that gets messy. People get shot. It's dangerous work. It's far easier to have the IRS come in and you go up to this, you know, deadbeat, who doesn't have a job because he doesn't have any IRS income, you know, no W-2s, no nothing, and but yet he's got a million bucks. And so the IRS comes up to that, you know, one each deadbeat and says, hey, where'd you get the million bucks? And you got some splaining to do. If you can't show some sort of legitimate income source for where you came about all that cash, then you go to jail. So it's a much cleaner, you know, legal situation for everybody involved. Nobody's involved in any drug shootouts. They just found you with a bunch of cash and you've got no way to explain it. So evidently, you know, it came from your your bad, bad ways. Anyway, so taxes paid throughout the whole system. Tax year, yeah, it ends on the 31st. So it goes by the calendar year and it's always paid in arrears. So when you know when you file your 2022 taxes well you do that in april of 2023 april 15th right and i mean i've i did my own taxes still do but i've got it screaming i mean there's somebody who dedicates her life i mean i'm a 
whatever, a S corporation with this and that and all this other stuff and everything's depreciated. And so it's, 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 uh, you know, somebody who does that every day and knows the ins and outs, um, is perhaps better. So I'll, I'll check the numbers and make sure everything looks good. Cause yeah, if I get audited or reviewed as they call it now, but anyway, if you get called out there, um, you're ultimately going to be, you know, partially responsible for what was filed on your behalf. But anyway, one of the things they do is automatically they always file an extension when I bring them the stuff. I don't know why, but that's just the way they do it. Um, so Security, Medicare, taxes. So, yeah, these are some, when you look on your paycheck and you see FICA and Social Security and Medicare. So you got two different programs here. We'll talk more about this in health insurance, but Medicare, that just means you're getting older, 65. Medicaid, that would be a welfare-type program. But anyway, things that are deducted by, uh, and you're paying for them. We'll talk about Social Security. Social Security is basically a tax. It's not like this, oh, lockbox with your name on it, and, and you know it's completely secure, and politicians don't rate it. Nope, it's 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 insolvent because politicians do rate it. They go in there and they take the money out, and anyway, um, it's it's a Ponzi scheme. Social Security is based upon that there's more people out there working, paying into Social Security, than there are retiring, and that was a valid, you know scheme until the baby boomers all started retiring so uh, I, I'm not saying that it's not going to be funded you know there's social security is usually pretty pretty well protected by the voters because they're old people and old people vote you know if <laughs> younger people your age voted then yeah you'd have more power but um, social security since it's you know old people there's, there's some single issue voters out there people who are focused completely on social security so it'll it'll be around but it's not a great lifestyle for you if if you're relying totally on that here's these are getting kind of older numbers but uh social security how it's funded and you can max it out you know this is probably a little higher now but yeah if you're and i i came upon this where i was working a couple different jobs um, I was teaching for the university and working full time for a defense contractor. And you know, if you hit that limit and you don't tell both employers about it, they'll both keep re holding back your full Social Security, and all of a sudden you're uh, paying more than you should. And self-employed, yeah, you pay it both. So personal income. So all these other forms, you know, 1040A, 1040EZ these are kind of like training wheels. If you're still filing these, you're probably not taking full advantage of the tax code. Uh, they, you know, the government love for you to overpay taxes. They love for you just to glom onto the simple form. And and literally, if you don't have a bunch of deductions, that's where you need to be. But once you get, you know, in a mature sort of financial life where you've got a house, where you've got, you know, tax strategies that fall well outside the scope of these things. So, um, Old chart here, but this is just kind of shows, you know. I, I apologize. They, it's not my thing. It's the graphics suck, but these are dates along the bottom and percentages, but you can, you can see the big picture here that income tax is a good chunk, but, you know, corporate tax, payroll tax, excise tax, other taxes, so it's not just income tax. And this is true, you know. This is called a progressive tax, where the more money you make, not only do you pay more in taxes, but a larger percent of your income is taxable. So most people would agree that that's fair. Where they don't tend to agree is that this is not income tax. When people are in negative percentages, that means they're getting money back. That's probably not the role of the income tax system. The other thing is that it's, you know, nobody's really getting a free break because um, what I mentioned was this was a progressive tax system, meaning it's, you know, considered more equitable, that it, it takes a bigger chunk um, in, in all dimensions of people who are making more money. Regressive taxes are ones that, you know, have a disproportionate effect on on lower wage earners. 
And you could argue that that things have gotten much more regressive in the past whatever number of years because all of the um, you know user fees and fines and everything else that again in my mind big picture are kind of taxes you know if I'm driving down the Glen and I get hit with a ticket you know it's a hundred bucks and I, I don't like that but you know if I'm somebody in a Ferrari you know with a million bucks that hundred bucks is that that's peanuts but if you're somebody in a you know in a beater with a heater who's just trying to get to their minimum wage, minimum wage job and they get hit with a hundred dollar ticket that's that's disproportionate and that you know fine system the tax code's not supposed to be like that it's supposed to be a little bit more equal and the same's true of you know car registration they don't take your income into account i'm not saying they should but I'm saying that they should not use, you know, a lot of those vehicle registrations to fund, you know, things that would normally be covered by taxes because when they do that, they end up with a regressive system. Anyway, lots of opinions out there. That was just one of them. Minimum wage, yeah, if you guys think $15 an hour is going to be, you know, the end all, well, I guess it's the minimum wage. I don't even know what it is now, but... If it was keeping keeping pace, it would have to be much higher given inflation. And again, this chart's getting old, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But keep in mind that minimum wage is is uh, now again minimum wage, not supposed to be a living wage. Minimum wage is sort of a training wage. If you've hit terminal job velocity and you're still getting paid minimum wage, um, yeah, you should be doing what you all are doing and going to school and get some education or get some training or getting your value up above that of a basically a trainee. So filing status. Um not too too difficult here. There's uh you know different categories. One is uh single obviously speaks for itself, you know. So divorce would fall in that category again. Um, then there's some sort of strategic ones, married filing jointly and married filing separately. It really depends on how the current tax code is done. And I'm going to be kind of a fan of some of the online tax services like TurboTax and other ones because even if you have somebody else run your taxes for you, it doesn't hurt for you just to kind of do it in the background as well. You know, with TurboTax or any of those things, you don't pay until you actually file. So you can punch in a bo bunch of bogus numbers and, uh, you know, put in your income and your spouse's income and, you know, file jointly and see how much your tax burden is and then swap it out. File um, two, you know, draft uh, returns filing separately and you pay the woman the lesser amount. And, you know, it's sometimes it, it just depends on your situation. Um, there's been times, you know, they used to call it the marriage penalty where where the tax code was written where, you know, it favored favored people um, filing separately. So, you know, whatever. Marriage, you know, there's a maybe a spiritual church element and then there's just the legal aspect of it. Well, there's nothing to prevent somebody from you know, getting divorced one day a year and then getting remarried the next year and then legally claiming that they were, you know, married or single or whatever. You know, talk to a lawyer before you do this. But sometimes people will go to those kinds of extremes to save money on taxes because it can make a difference. Usually it happens where, you know, somebody's making a ton of money and the other person's not, you know, or, or something like that, you know, in terms of the couple. So, uh, but y you have some... Um, you know, uh, flexibility in there. Okay, so head of household, it's a lot like single, but single's going to get clobbered, right? You don't have any children. You know, and again, the tax code, they want to encourage families. They want to encourage people to, you know, be taking care of kids and uh, doing all that good stuff. So if you're one of those people, you're single, but you've got somebody who's dependent upon you and you're taking care of them, well, then they, they they throw you a bone. They they say, okay, you can file, you know, in a better status. So what all this is going to equate to is is how much your tax bill is. So the worst case is going to be single. That's going to be the person with the, you know, highest percentage having to be paid in taxes. 
filing jointly, it's going to be quite a bit lower. Uh, separately, it's going to look a lot like single. Head of household is going to look a lot like filing jointly because they're giving you a bone. Qualifying widower, yeah, so, you know, your spouse died, so, you know, you got a lot going on. They don't throw you under the bus that year, you know, do some sort of gotcha and say, well, you're single now, you know, and have to pay full taxes. No, they, they give you a little bit of time to, to get through that. So, the 1040. All these forms, don't let them overwhelm you. You don't have to know all this stuff. You don't see these forms, even if you go on the online type things. You know, you fill in all the little menus, and you answer all the little questions, and bada-bing, it prints out a form for you. So you, you could go through there and, you know, nug this out, but it's 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 not the way it's done. The, also, the, uh, you know, all the online type things, you know, you type them in one year, and, you know, it's already pre-populated. And, and you're just making exceptions and changes and fixing it. And it knows your situation from the year before. So if you, you know, don't deduct the mortgage insurance or the mortgage, uh, yeah, in, uh, interest or forget to do this or forget to do that, you know, you get a little nudge saying, wait a minute, did you sell your house and wherever? Why are you not deducting this? And then you're like, oh, yeah. Also, and this gets into the whole, you know, privacy stuff. But if you're willing to give these people, um, you know, a little bit of information in terms of passwords to some of your accounts, it'll import all those forms, all those tax forms, and put them in the right spot and put them in the right boxes. And it, it, it is, you know, there's some value for that. So I'm not saying to give up your privacy and, and everything, um, you know, for nothing. But in this case, there is, you know, a, a bit of value coming back to you in terms of uh, um, accuracy and, and getting the thing filled out. so. But anyway, all these big picture things. You know, you're going to put in your income, um, you know, and then there's going to be an AGI, which is an adjusted gross income, and then there's going to be deductions, and there's going to be this and that, and all kinds of other little things that I'm not going to go through the fine print on. And then finally, it's going to say, okay, look up, and, you know, how much was withheld, meaning... In your check, you know, you withheld whatever amount each each paycheck. And that's why I'm saying it's kind of a savings account, you know. The government doesn't necessarily trust you to just, you know, keep all the money on your own. They want you to withhold. And uh, they kind of kept keep it set aside. And it's an estimate of what your taxes are going to be at the end of the year. And then when you actually do your taxes in April... You know, you look at what you withheld and what you actually owe. And if it's a positive number, you know, you owe them money. If it's a negative number, then you got to cough up money. So what you want is you want those things to, you know, almost sort of match. Now, if you're way on the low side and you owe, you know, three, four, five grand, now the IRS is like, wait a minute, you are, you know, not playing by the rules here. We're going to slap you with a penalty. We're going to uh, make you start doing quarterly payments. We're going to do all kinds of stuff. So you can go too far the other direction as well. So gross income. Remember I talked about adjusted gross income. This is, this is the early number. This is before the adjustments. So everything. And I mean everything, you know, wages, salaries, interest, income. Let's say you're, you know, you're at the casino and you get a 1099G, as in G for gambling, gaming, whatever. Yeah, that's going to end up here in income. Um, these are investments. These are, you know, straight earned things. Um, dividends, capital gains. Capital gains means, you know, you bought it for one price, you sold it for more. And here comes... Remember I said everything over a year is long-term. Everything under a year is short-term. So that stays. And, uh, yep. So short-term, just a quick summarize. Short-term is going to be taxed at your normal rate. So let's say you're around about in a 28% tax bracket. 28% of that capital gain is going to go away from taxes because you held it, you know, 364 days. If you hold it 366 over a year, well then, boom, your taxes generally go to about 
because it's a long-term capital gain. So when they say, oh, you know, it's not fair, Warren Buffett's, you know, taxed at such a lower rate than his secretary, well, that's because his secretary is relying on income, which is taxed at her normal rate, whereas Warren Buffett, you know, the Oracle of Omaha, the guy, he's a big investor if you don't know. We'll talk about him a little later in the course, but anyway, he's talk, taxed on investments, and go figure, he's, you know, smart enough to um, generally keep things 12 months or longer, you know, in most cases, to avoid that higher tax rate. And you want that. You want people to have stability in the market. You want people to invest. You don't want to up that to 30%, because then they're like, well, screw that. I'm going to go, you know, invest my money somewhere where I'm not getting hit by 30%. So, they, you know, it's a competitive world out there. You, you, you know, especially the ultra wealthy, they have the ability to, you know, take their take their money and go elsewhere, and they will if 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 it's not favorable for them. So, you got to be very careful about trying to, uh, you know, punish the rich because, well, they're, they're kind of the ones who, you know, pump the money into the economy, hire the people, you know, keep the factories going, and whether they put their factory here or they put it overseas is depends on what the tax schemes like. So, capital gains. So, yep, 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 yeah. Tax rate lower. So, typically about fifteen percent. Zero to twenty. Yep. Determining gross income. So everything. So, this is where you can get into trouble. You know, if you're getting tips under the table, you know, you may have one of these eighty-seven thousand IRS agents kind of watching you and. Maybe trying to account for some of that. All righty. Schedule B. So again, interest, ordinary dividends. This is all going to go into income. Dividends are things you interest. We kind of understand that, right? If you're, you know, have something in a savings account. Um, and you're given a, a form, generally a 1099 INT as an in interest. If you have stock that is a special type of stock, a big mature company that pays dividends, an income stock, um, then you know they're a big, huge company. They're not necessarily growing anymore. They're not building a bunch of factories and stuff. So rather than plow their profits back into the business, they pay dividends out to the shareholders and. You know, that's why you might want to have one of those big companies. Or you might want to have the small companies that are growing rapidly and the share price is going up. A lot of strategy in that. But anyway, if you get a 1099 INT, that's for those things generally. Or, um, I'm sorry, you can be DIV for dividend. Uh, capital gains and losses. So, again, I've talked about home ownership. can be a great thing because... Uh, yeah, you buy some stock and you sell it and, you know, you show $10,000 gain and you got to pay taxes on that. Let's say you, you know, bigger, bigger issues here. You know, you buy a house for three hundred grand, you sell it for four hundred grand, and you got to pay tax on $100,000 unless you've lived in it three out of the past five years and, you know, done a couple other things. Anyway, if, if it's an owner-occupier, if you've actually lived in it, then um, you can you can uh, keep that money tax free. So there's all sorts of little incentives. I mean, the the lobby for real estate and and they kind of got your best interest at heart as well. I mean that that encourages um, investment in real estate by having preferred tax treatments. I, I had a buddy we were living in Spain at the time, and he uh, he'd been in the military pff, probably 25 years or something. And, but he'd grown up in a rough part of East L.A. in California, and he had an old rental house there, and it was worth quite a bit, even though it was a you know nasty neighborhood. Well, Spanish real estate market, it, he got clobbered, and he was kind of hurting for money. And him and his wife sucked it up, and they moved to East L.A. and lived in that house for three years so they could sell that house um, and, and get all the capital gains. So I don't know that I'd give up three years of my life for it, but um, some people will. Anyway, 1040. 
So, I mean, this stuff is not that hard, but it's written in a lot of IRS speak. You know, if you've got an IRS question, I find the best way to do it is Google it, get kind of your, you know, head wrapped around the terms, figure out what's what's involved here. You know, free information on Google is it's free and most likely worthless and likely wrong as well but now at least you understand the terms and then that you know there's three steps here the first step was that the second step is to go to maybe something like a oh Barron's or Ernst and Young tax or anyway there's all these tax preparation kind of guides out there that are fairly authoritative because they rely on the IRS code and so but they're written more in plain English so you know you 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 went from you know, very low trust in the Google environment to fairly high trust in in this, you know, dedicated, you know, tax publication that stands behind their stuff. And since it is a good tax publication that stands behind its stuff, they will reference the IRS pub. And so that's the third step. You go to the actual IRS pub, and now that you've got a bit of an education and you can make heads or tails of the, of the, you know, forms and everything else they're talking about, you can go through and look at the source document and make sure what you're doing is in line. So, and, and you've, you know, you'll get in situations where you are the expert. I mean, uh, things I wanted to do up here in real estate when I was purchasing a property, people are like, oh, you can't do that. Uh, uh, no, that's not, just because they'd never seen it before. I purchased this piece of property, again, not to go, go off into war stories, but you know, it was a big chunk of property, and, and there was no way to really get it done. But I got some of my retirement savings, and I, it was in an IRA, an individual retirement account. And there's a company, there's a few companies, but the company I used was out of California. And they put the big chunk of the property in um, an IRA. And it was my IRA, and I could derived no benefit from that property, you know, while it was under IRA status, but it enabled me to buy a big chunk of that back part of the property. The middle part, I just paid cash for it, and I set the price and did that. And the forward part, because I'm a veteran, the VA, they, they, they lose their minds if you try and buy anything over 10 acres. So I put a very small part right around the house that excluded some shed that would never pass a VA inspection. So kind of a screwy lot line, but I purchased that with a with a VA loan, and it's 9.3 acres, because if you're in the borough, Matsu borough, and you have a property over 9.3 acres, um, you don't need a septic inspection, so, you know, that's 100 bucks that you need to spend, so, anyway, it's somewhere between 9.3 and 10 acres, so, under 10 for the VA to keep them happy, over 9.3 to keep the the Matsu happy, and anyway, you, you can do a lot of different stuff, and then, you know, you roll it all into an LLC, and you combine it all back up together after you get it bought, so anyway, things like that, you, you're you not going to, real estate agents will, they don't, they're not looking for that kind of difficulty, the tax people, they're uh, very few, at least in this state, I, I didn't find anybody, so you got to do the research yourself, and figure it out, and get it done, and it can be all legal. Okay, gross income. Back to that. So we got everything in there. Now we're getting into AGI. So now there's certain things. The reason why you you know give money to an individual retirement account is because it gets reduced from that gross income. So let's say you give 20, 20 grand to your IRA and you're making a hundred grand. Well, when you go to that tax code, you're only paying taxes on eighty thousand. Alimony. Yeah, that's this is kind of funny. Alimony is a uh, it it is tax deductible, but it's not used much. Um, whatever spouses don't necessarily like alimony because if they've got children involved, if they do child support, child support's tax free to them. Alimony is taxable to to the spouse, so the courts will generally opt for whatever. It gets political. Interest on student loans. <laughs> not that you guys are paying them. And then other special circumstances, so other things involved. Standard deduction. So when we talk about some of those easy forms, you know, and other things, what the IRS says is, 
look, you know, we know you're not going to pay taxes on the full amount of your income. You know, you're going to go through and you're going to weasel around. You're going to find all these deductions, you know. You're going to say, well, I'm in the military, and, you know, by necessity in the military, I had to keep my hair short, so therefore I'm deducting my haircuts. And, you know, I've got some unreimbursed unreimbursed uniform expenses and I'm deducting those and I'm gonna I'm just gonna you know make mine in their life a living hell and come up with all these little deductions um, but the IRS says ah, just let's just make this easier I'll tell you what we'll, we'll give you credit for some arbitrary amount of deductions like 16 grand and you just take we'll call that the standard deduction and uh, if you take the standard deduction then you don't have to itemize anything you can just take the standard deduction and not get involved and and so most people go yeah I'm you know I'm lazy and my deductions aren't going to equate to 16 grand so let's just do that and so that's what they kind of want now what happens very quickly is if you're you know kind of mature financially and you got a house for example and let's say you live in the borough um, the uh, Mat, uh, not the Matsu, but the municipality of Anchorage. I mean, pff, you're probably paying twelve grand in, I don't know, combined um, interest on the loan and uh, property taxes. It's, it could be like eighteen grand. So let's say just with those two items alone, they're offering you a sixteen thousand dollar standard deduction. You're like, wait a minute, I've got already eighteen thousand in, you know. Other deductions, I'm going to itemize. I'm going to fill out more forms and take the time and and you know get more money back. And oh, by the way, yeah, now that I'm doing this, I'm going to go ahead and do all that thing with the haircuts. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And I'm going to find every deduction possible that are legal and uh, pay the least amount of taxes. So that there's going to be a turning point in your life. And, Probably a lot of you are already there where you're itemizing. Some of you aren't there. And some people never get there, which is sad, because that means you're, you know, you're, you're paying rent to somebody. I don't mean sad that it's you know, not a great existence, you know, living in an apartment or whatever, but I'm also saying it's sad in terms of, uh, especially in inflationary times, your rent is going to go up with inflation, whereas if you buy a house, uh, your mortgage payment is what it is. You know, if it's 1800 bucks. This month, 30 years from now, it's still going to be 1800 bucks, whereas that rent is going to be, you know, 36, 4 grand, something like that. So, anyway, um, enough of that. Okay, so these are some deductions. This is back in 2015, so my apologies. The data out of the book is, um, this. some of the stuff's getting old. But the, the numbers are relative, but they're still staying about, you know, this is probably... I think about 16, 18 grand now. So, again, married filing jointly, that's the one that they, you know, have the biggest deduction. This person had a household, so it's a kind of a single parent situation, or could be even be an elder that you're taking care of. Anyway, they, you know, throw you a bone, 92.50. And then single, um, the standard deduction is quite a bit less, and married filing separately, you're essentially single. So, Itemized deductions. So we talked about this. Um, yeah, I hit on a couple. Mortgage, state income taxes, and, but we're not paying that here. Uh, real estate tax, medical expenses. Keep in mind, medical expenses, you don't have to worry about keeping a whole bunch of receipts unless you're very sick. You know, if you're making hundred grand a year, you got to have $10,000 worth of un reimbursed expenses so if the insurance company pays for it you get nothing you know but if your copay is you know it's still a lot of money say say your medical expenses are six seven grand you didn't even make the threshold so charitable gifts yep so again they want you to do that right be sure to keep receipts I've done this before where you know I generally take liability insurance on some of my older cars any crash one or something gets stolen, write it off. Job expenses, depends on the type, but certainly for like job search expenses, again, this is one of those things where, you know, you got to go through that search to figure out which job expenses are legit. So, you know, 
get a big picture from the from the internet find the tax document and then find the IRS document and you'll know what's legal decide whether well this is easy I mean you're gonna take the higher one if 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 your deductions are more than the standard then that's what you're doing unless you're silly TurboTax we're gonna go to an iteration of that here in a second I'm not sure if we're ready for that just yet exemptions this has to do with children this has to do also with withholding you can manipulate legally your withholdings by you know claiming your children not claiming your children or dependents what have you um, but that that's how they decide how much to withhold is based upon your exceptions now when you actually file you have to put in the you know file as in signing do, filing your return you have to put in the actual numbers but before that you have some flexibility taxable income and then calculating taxes so here they're talking about the projected progressive tax that's you know what society has deemed beneficial you know the rich get hit a bit harder but again you know politicians need to be smart if you hit people too hard you know they move to Texas they move I don't think too many people are moving to Alaska for taxes but they could um, so 2021 some more current numbers um, anyway this has to do with tax brackets and there's a video that I found that's actually pretty damn good and it, and it explains um, you know how brackets work this is one of those things where you know the first thing there's a lot of people out there who profess to know taxes and and you can just ask them a couple quick questions you can sort them out pretty quick number one I already mentioned the person who you know talks about getting a huge refund and, and thinks that they got one over on the IRS now they just punish themselves the more kind of probing question would be asked people about brackets you know when somebody says oh I don't want to make you know any more money because that's gonna push me into a different bracket well they they don't understand the concept okay so there are a few programs out there maybe like say some sort of Obamacare or some sort of health care program maybe uh, student loan type things where there's an income limit you know if you exceed that income limit you no longer qualify for the program but if you're not involved in any of that stuff um, you know this is a much more straightforward situation so what happens is when somebody says oh I, you know I don't want to make whatever in this case I don't want to make more than 86 375 because then I'm going to get pushed into the higher you know 24 percent tax bracket and I don't want to do that because that's going to cost me a lot of money no no that is you're an idiot so what happens is if somebody and this applies to anybody let's say somebody's making a hundred grand okay so that's gonna end up putting them in the 24 ultimately in the 24 percent tax bracket but listen I'll tell you kinda how well I'll tell you exactly how this works okay so you got a hundred grand that first um, ten thousand dollars out you know ninety nine nine fifty that first tranche of money from your first dollar to 99 you know 950 is going to be taxed at 10 percent okay and we're talking for a single guy you can use whatever bracket you want but anyway so you're you are in this case you're you're only paying 10 percent but it's on that chunk of money okay from the dollar you know 99 951 to 40 grand whatever 525 on that segment of your income you're paying 12 percent okay and then on this next segment from 4526 to 86 375 you're paying 22 percent now the knucklehead who said hey I, I don't want to make you know eighty seven thousand dollars because I'm gonna be in the 24 percent tax bracket no the the little chunk that little increment from what is that? Don't make me do six hundred six twenty-five. 
about right. Anyway, that that six hundred and twenty five dollars of his income is going to fall into this thing and be taxed at twenty four percent, but the rest of his income's unchanged. So anyway, that's how tax brackets work. So anybody who says I'm going to get pushed in a different bracket and it's going to be whatever, I'm not doing it. Now, if you're somebody up in this, even these numbers though, this you know, not to get political, but these were. Um, you know, numbers that are still kind of left over from the Trump era. But let's say this number was much higher. Yeah, somebody's going to say, well, I'm making a half a million. Um, if I make any more money, all that more money I make is going to be taxed at, at you know, whatever, 50 or 60 percent. Let's say the tax code's written that way. You're like, that's not worth it. I'm not giving half of that money to the government. I'll stick at my, you know, below 523,000 and just pay 35% on the money and you know I'm working hard enough. So that's where you know if if and this is all about reasonableness. If if these numbers go eh you know there's I don't think there's anybody out there who's rolling in it who's like, well, I don't want to make over 523 cuz I'm going to get charged, you know, incrementally 2% more in taxes. I don't think that 2% is going to be a you know, a game changer for them. Now, if this is combined with state income, let's say they live in New York, California, whatever, and, and these numbers are essentially double, they're probably going to get to that decision point maybe earlier on. They're going to say, look, I'm not going beyond this, or, or I'm going to, you know, hide my money somewhere else. Or uh, That's what you don't want. You don't want people working harder to, you know, take their money elsewhere to avoid taxes. You want to make the tax code appear semi-reasonable. Long-term capital gains, so the 15%, 20% rate. So it depends on how much they are. And so this is kind of nice where, you know, you can make a, a fair amount of capital gains and not have it taxed. So there's there's more. When I just say 15% for long-term, there's, there's a little bit more to the story. But keep in mind that these are not in that 30-some percent rate of normal income. If you kept it less than a year, if this was short-term, it would be taxed at whatever these rates are. All right. Uh, determining tax liability. Yeah, so how much did you pay? You know, how much was withheld? Uh, look at the chart. Boom. That's how much you owe. Credits. So there's things called credits and deductions. Not at all the same. Okay. Credits are awesome. Credit means it's a one-for-one one thing, as it should be, you know. You've done well, you know, you're procreating, you got new children coming out there in the world, we're going to give you a thousand bucks. I think it's a little more than that now. But but anyway, um, that is a credit. So you owed your tax liability, let's say it was, you know, 17 grand, guess what? It's now 16 grand, you know. It's, it's a credit. It's a one-for-one one thing. That's cool. Um, college. You know, 529. See this? Remember when I talked about college savings plans? This isn't hard. You you don't have to remember all these numbers. What you have to be able to do is go to a website and say, hey, I'm looking at saving for my children's college. And they'll say, you know, Vanguard, Fidelity, yada, yada, yada. Any one of these companies is going to have a section on that, and they're going to steer you towards a tax-advantaged plan. So it's it's dead easy if you take advantage of the resources that are out there for you. Earned income, that's more of a low income thing. And, uh, yeah, adoption, again, you know, if you're you're doing good, you know, that's good for society. And getting kids out of foster care, whatever their situation is, you should be compensated. You know, it's only fair. So when people talk about loopholes, oh, that's a loophole. No, it's not. It's, it's, that's good. I'm not saying all loopholes are good, but a lot of things in the tax code are, you know, there because they're beneficial. I think we're probably going to go to TurboTax. Yep, okay. So, and that's going to be the homework. So, let's look at a couple things first off. Since I just mentioned it, we got TurboTax up and ready to go, but let's just, you know, I'll show you. I like Fidelity. Anyway, there's about 20 different companies out there. They're all good. Um, they're all huge. None of them are obviously based in Alaska. Most of them are, you know, some sort of East Coast presence. I'm not going to do this, and you don't need to do any of this. I've got accounts with them, obviously, but but um, um, 
for what you're doing for the research for this class, um, this is going to work for you. So you can see, you know, you want information on mutual funds, retirement, education. I mean, yeah, they're going to favor their products a little bit, but they're going to go through and tell you what to do, you know. And so, like, let's look at this 529 thing real quick. And they'll go through kind of why choose a 529. So, you know, whatever. Tuition. They'll tell you what happens if you decide not to do it. Beneficiary changes. You know, you switch from one child to another. State incentives. They know the states. You know, so anyway, I mean, I could just as easily. Let's try another one. Vanguard. I don't have accounts with Vanguard, but they're big. And this is where, when we're talking like emergency funds and stuff like that, not keeping a bunch of money in your checking account, this is what I'm talking about. You put it in a brokerage type thing like this. These guys do banking. They can do all kinds of stuff. But they're not meant for, you know, paying your utilities and stuff. There's not a lot of movement in this account. So if there's some sort of identity theft, it's going to be readily apparent to you. And, you know, you can squash it. So, um... Anyway, we're a personal investor. And personalized advice. So, yeah, the, the, you know, give them your email at your own risk. I'm not advocating for that because you don't generally need to do that. But resources, education, you know, how to invest, choosing. Um, but, anyway, let's just say we want to get straight to it. It's not quite as straightforward as the, uh, what do you call it, uh, fidelity one, but you know your guide to saving for college so you can you know plagiarize a little bit of this maybe cut and paste a little chart but a bing now you're going to get an a on your term paper because you did a little bit of research and and believe me you'll use it when you when you need it you know and again the irs wants people to go to school they you want your child to have as much money as possible and needlessly pain um, you know, that money, uh, let's, I want to check something real quick, anyway, there's limits in here, uh, I'm just curious about my scenario where you decide not to, uh, um, have your child go to school and use this money to buy a boat, you know, instead, uh, I think it'll probably be addressed under penalty, if I could spell right. Anyway, 10%, so whatever, you know. But it's probably worth it because, you know, you, you, you wait till this child's born, you know, and you raise them properly, and you're, you're probably not going to have those issues. But, yeah, it's, it's not like the money's lost. It's just that, yeah, you kind of reneged on on the promise you saved it for college and you didn't so you pay us 10 percent let's see if we can get on here in a hurry um oh boy i'm gonna pause this for just a potato get a code All right, yeah, for me to uh, do any of those code things, because my internet service is not good out here, or cell service is not, I have to, whatever, go outside and turn off the Wi-Fi and get a signal, so it's uh, not quite as easy. But anyway, we're into TurboTax now, so, it, you know, it's a pretty secure site. They, they always have some sort of two-factor authentication. I guess that was two-factor, but anyway. Um... So, personal info, yeah, I put in a bunch of bogus numbers. So, Jay Parks, that's not quite me. I wasn't born in 81. But but anyway, it, it doesn't matter because I'm just trying to get uh, info. You know, the important stuff, the state's right. Uh, that's actually my phone number. Anyway, I also uh, put in some numbers here for income just to give you kind of a rough idea. They're, they're trying to upsell me right off, but again, I haven't given them a credit card. I'm not doing that. Um, so I put in, go figure, I'm making exactly 100 grand. So cool. 
and I had uh, twenty thousand dollars withheld. So magically, so nice round numbers. So we got something to work with. Again, you can you can you know do exactly what I'm doing right now. And when somebody says, well, you know, you should buy a house so you'll get a better tax deduction. How much? Well, it depends on your circumstances. So, the beauty is, this number right here, this is the federal, you know, refund. This is how much I'm getting back. So, I paid twenty grand, but based upon having a house and giving some money to charity, I'm getting money back. I withheld too much. Let's say I... Um, uh, let's try and get into this thing. What I want to do is I want to pretend that I don't have a house and just show you what happens. So, um, nine grand, because that's what I paid on taxes. Come on. Mm. I know, that's getting a little frustrating. Sometimes you got to deal with stuff. Needs review. I didn't pay it, put in any mortgage interest either. So, oof, I put in that I was going to pay $18,000. Yeah, some bogus bank. If you pay taxes, you'll get a thing called a 1098. So, um, you know, but you don't have to guess at these numbers. Calculate your interest. They do all that for you. So, you just enter in the 1098. And here I said it was 18 grand. Um, outstanding mortgage, other numbers. Well, guess what? Let's say I don't have a house. I'm just renting. So I have no deductions for mortgage interest or property tax. So, am I, you know, let's say I'm paying $1,800 in rent and $1,800 in a mortgage. And that mortgage had the escrows that included all those taxes and stuff. But now, those no longer exist, because I'm a renter. And, uh, uh, now it's frustrated. Yeah, I don't want that either. You got to work with this stuff. This is kind of a, a sloppy way of doing it real time. But I just want to show you what's possible. What if I don't have a... I just want to eliminate it. Well, anyway, okay, so it finally kind of got rid of it, switched those numbers. So I went from getting 8406 back, so, you know, $8,400, to now only getting about five grand back. So, by not owning a home, I paid, you know, what is that about, I even forgot my numbers, $2,400, because I don't get that tax deduction. So, this brings us to the point. I, I really didn't discuss it yet. I'll, I'll discuss it later in the chapter, but I'll go over it really quick. I talked about a tax credit. You know, say you adopt. Say you have a child. Um, you get a tax credit, a one-for-one -one reduction. So, if I had a $1,000 tax credit, this number would go, you know, from whatever, forty nine eighty five dollars to thirty nine eighty five because I had a $1,000 credit. Now, what happened, the reason why this number went from 8406 to 4985 is because I had a tax deduction. So, a deduction versus a credit. Meaning that the way a deduction works, let's say you give some money to, to charity. So, let's push it up to a, to a charitable type thing. Um, deductions and credits. We're going to see all tax. Oh, no, there it is right there. Okay. So, now I'm paying. We, we got rid of the mortgage, so we're, we're only getting five grand back. Okay. And, but I gave money to Goodwill. Okay. This Goodwill, since it's a you know registered charity, the rest of that, it all conforms to the IRS, it is tax deductible. And I gave it within that current tax year. That's why they want to know the date. And they want to know kind of what it is. And this is kind of for your accounting, furniture, whatever. Let's say I burn it. Let's say I give them nothing. So, watch this number. 
and it went down to zero and I guess I got to get done with this you've done a great job oh uh, that's because I'm hitting the I, what I'm done now okay we're, we're learning a couple things here one is I've now gotten into the realm because I don't have enough deductions they're taking they're giving me credit for the standard deduction this program is smart enough to go wait a minute um, since you don't have all those other deductions you now it's more beneficial for you to take the standard deduction so we're gonna you know insert that 16 grand in there and so when you don't give to charity that number doesn't change let's go back into here real quick I know this is getting a little bit more drawn out but that's the way it goes so what I have in here about nine grand I think I think that was the number I used and I want to put that um, mortgage interest I think I had 18 in here you guys are in a far better position to figure out whether I had the same numbers anyway none of these apply and we're saying this number was a you know whopping amount 18 grand not completely unreasonable but outstanding mortgage principal I think about 400 yeah so I, I changed the numbers up somewhere but anyway now I'm back into the realm where um, I'm better off to be taking the itemized deduction rather than the standard deduction okay so now we're going to kind of fast forward back to where we were and we're going to whatever these people are it's a little annoying no yeah sure whatever now they want to know all kinds of questions but I think they're good now donations to charity so you know I'm no longer Scrooge McDuck I'm giving a thousand bucks to charity one thousand ha look at that so it's back up to a grand okay so now we're gonna go back and we're gonna look at the original example I was talking about so I owe 8406 that's my my amount of I mean not oh I'm getting that amount of money back which is nice why am I getting that back? Because I was a good guy. I, you know, itemized my deductions. I had mortgage interest. I had other things going on. But let's say I'm going to stiff these folks. Okay, so that was $1,000 of value. And now it's going to zero. And my taxes went. They changed. But they didn't change by 1000 Because this is tax deductible. It's not a tax credit. Meaning, so somebody says, oh, you need to give this charity because it's tax deductible. Well, that's great, but let's say you're, for practical purposes, you're in the 30% tax bracket. What that means is you give, you know, Goodwill, in this case, a 1000 bucks. Your tax bill, if you're in the 30% bracket, goes down by $300, right? Your income came down by one thousand dollars let's say you're making a hundred grand you give them a thousand bucks your income is now ninety nine thousand and by not paying taxes on that additional thousand bucks you saved three hundred bucks so I mean there's some value in it but it's not a credit it's a deduction so it's all cool I, I, I don't know if you track me through all that I think you probably learned something because there's a couple things you learn one that once you get below the threshold for taking the standard deduction all this stuff doesn't matter um, but if you're above that level which is where you want to be and believe me if you have a home and you're paying you know you're still paying um, on the mortgage um, then you're paying interest you're paying um, taxes on it all that stuff's deductible 
And we could go through and we could look at all kinds of stuff. Let's say we're not done with charitable deductions. Now, I guess I did tell them I'm done. But you could do all kinds of things. Expenses, scholarships. You know, there's, uh, there's so many brackets in here. You know, it's going to take you through every one. And there's competitors out here for, for you know, TurboTax. So I'm not shilling for these guys. There's there's other programs and conceivably better programs. But these guys seem to be pretty on top of it. But anyway, um, when you want to do this, you know, you're, you're going to say give your forms or do your forms and do all that stuff, um, you know, sometime in the spring. But guess what? If you have passed um, the end of the calendar year, if it is now the new year, you're screwed in terms of making changes. You can't like, oh, I'm going to sell a house or I'm going to, um, you know, change my investments around. There's usually some exceptions, maybe with a 401k or not 401k, but an IRA where you can, you know, switch some money around. But but big moves financially, you know, filing a well, actually, filing status you can change, but certainly getting divorced, getting remarried, doing that, all that happy hua, you can't do that after the first of the year because what you're doing now affects the taxes for the following year. So, you know, round about November, December, it does not hurt to get into one of these programs, run all your numbers, you know, kind of suss stuff out and decide, oh, I mean, I, I, for example, we all make mistakes. I was paying a tremendous amount of um, out-of-state taxes. I sent my daughter to Auburn down in Alabama, paying full out-of-state, the whole bit. And I thought, ah, at least I'll get a tax break on it. No, because I didn't qualify. I had a little too much income, and so, you know, Nothing uh, could I have changed and slipped under to get that wicket? I I didn't even have the opportunity because I didn't notice it till it was past the first of the year. So you got to kind of keep on top of it, and um, you know, and also it'll change your things. You know, oh, I need to save these receipts. I don't need to save these receipts. You know, because I'm going to deduct this, and so this is important or whatever. Changing things up. Um, I had again another military story. I had a friend who was, uh, this was post-Desert Storm, a whole bunch of Navy guys were getting thrown out. And they were throwing these guys out like the end of the year. And um, then they were going to give them a bonus also in that same end of the year. And so these guys, you know, being smart, you know, naval aviators, they all got together and, and wrote a letter saying, look, you know, if you will just delay, you know, giving us our, our severance money, until after, you know, the first of the year, you will be doing us a, you know, a huge favor, a huge solid. Because cause what happened was they got their money, um, you know, in the next tax year when they're all probably just going back to school or doing whatever, certainly not making big money. So rather than have a whopping income, you know, in the previous year, they had their normal income in that year. And then they had their, you know, severance stuff in the following year. So it sounded like a great plan until the Navy realized we, we, we screwed up and we got rid of too many people. And so now <laughs> you either can't get out or we're not going to pay you a bonus to get out. So by delaying, a lot of them got screwed. But you, you got to give it to them. It was good good planning. Anyway, this has been just a rambling lecture. Yeah, we're over an hour. So we're, we're going to call it there. But uh, anyway, taxes are interesting. A um, lot that can be done. Um, always changing. Always need for good people, not not like, you know, out there staying on a street corner spinning a sign, but people who actually understand taxes, few and far between. And if you're good at it, um, people will seek you out. So not a bad thing. Not, you know, I, I again, another caution. I've had a bunch of my fellow aviator friends who would take some, you know, weekend course and all of a sudden be tax preparers and, yeah, if you filed your taxes with them, number one, some of these guys are not the sharpest tools in the shed. And also, um, they weren't looking for anything unusual because, you know, it wasn't their money. And there's no return clients coming back to those places. If you have your own tax person on the side, or maybe you're that tax person, 
you know, you've got some skin in the game and you will know the laws and know how to pay uh, the least possible. All right. Good on you.